Well, thank you so much, Patty. Uh, obviously, it goes without saying that we will all uh, miss you so very dearly. Um, to welcome everyone uh, to this evening's uh, Heinz R. Pagel's public lecture. Of course, this is, it, as Patty indicated, part of a weekly series of summer lectures that are brought to you here by the Aspen Center for Physics. Uh, as Patty said, I'm Nathaniel Craig. I'm tonight's host. And my main job this evening is to give you information on uh, three different things. So the ACP, uh, the Heinz Pagel's public lecture, and of course, tonight's speaker. So as many of you know, uh, this year we're celebrating the 60th summer of physics in Aspen, starting with uh, 45 physicists and founding in the summer of 1962. The Aspen Center for Physics now hosts about 1,000 physicists uh, each year spread between summer workshops and winter conferences, and all with the instrumental support of the National Science Center. During this time, the center has borne witness to the first string revolution, uh, the origins of modern cosmology, the foundations of our current understanding, for example, of high temperature superconductors, and the birth of open access science uh, with the creation of the archive preprint server, to name just a few. It's really where physicists from around the world come to do their very best work. Um, so how has the ACP come to play such a central role in modern physics? Uh, maybe it's the inspiring setting or the respite from the worries of daily life or the supportive staff and community uh, or the serendipity of chance encounters between scientists here. In truth, it's really all of the above uh, and a lot more. Um, and, you know, I think as physicists, our job is to understand nature at the deepest level, uh, both the actual laws of nature and also the conceivable ones. And so when you gaze into nature, as the ACP so wonderfully allows us to do, sometimes, you know, just sometimes, uh, nature gazes back into you. So the ACP, of course, has also played a vital role in taking these scientific breakthroughs out of the ivory tower and, and to the public uh, through events such as the public lecture series uh, that brings us together this evening. Uh, these public lectures are named in memory of Heinz Pegel, who was a professor uh, of physics at Rockefeller University, president of the New York Academy of Science, a trustee of the Aspen Institute, and a member of the Aspen Center for Physics for 20 years. Heinz was known for his contributions to the physics of elementary particles and cosmology, among other things, and for his effective dissemination of scientific knowledge to the public through his books and his lectures. A uh, part-time local resident of Aspen, he tragically died in a climbing accident on Pyramid Peak in 88, but his memory lives on, uh, of course, in this lecture series. <laughs> so tonight, uh, we have the tremendous pleasure of hearing from Dr. Sophie Renner, who is currently a Stephen Hawking Fellow and lecturer in physics at the University of Glasgow. Dr. Renner earned her PhD in 2016 with Professor Ben Allenack in the renowned Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, in the last year of her PhD, she traveled to Santa Barbara as a graduate fellow at the Cavalry Institute of Theoretical Physics, where I had the first uh, first had the pleasure of encountering her scintillating physics. From Cambridge to Santa Barbara, Dr. Renner went on to research positions in Mainz, Trieste, and the legendary theory group of CERN before taking up a faculty position in Glasgow. She is truly a rising star in the field of theoretical particle physics, and we are absolutely delighted for her to deliver tonight's lecture. I think hearing from such a rising star in this sort of venue. It's really our equivalent of hearing the Beatles at the Cavern Club in Liverpool in 61 and 62. <laughs> uh, before we begin, of course, we request that all participants in this event and all of our events conduct themselves in a manner that is welcoming to all other participants, treating each other with respect and consideration, free from any form of discrimination or harassment. Creating a supportive environment uh, to enable scientific discourse is central to the mission of the Aspen Center. And so, without further ado, I give you Dr. Renner. Thank you, Nathaniel, for that ridiculously flattering introduction. <laughs> and thank you all for coming uh, to hear my talk. Um, over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about particle physics, how we know what we know about the smallest constituents of our universe, and how we are currently working to find out more. Uh, OK. So I'm going to start in an art gallery. So um, this is a painting by Georges Sura. And um, if you were standing on the opposite side of the room, uh, say about the distance that you're looking at it now, um, you would see a picture of people relaxing on the side of the Seine. But if you step a little bit closer, you start to see how this painting is made. And it's made up of lots of little dots of paint. 
And if you step even closer, um, so that your nose is almost touching the painting, uh, just before the gallery attendant would come to take you away, um, you all you would see would be the dots of paint. At this point, you're so close that you can't really see the whole picture anymore. So if there was a spider who was living on this painting, he would never know what, what the painting was of. He would just describe it in terms of dots of paint around him. We have two different perspectives on this same object. A uh, person standing in the gallery would, uh, would describe what she was seeing as you know, a painting of people by a river. Um, but the spider uh, would describe it just as blobs of paint um, with, of varying colors and in varying positions. Um, and of course, they're both accurately describing the same thing. They're just describing it on you know, different viewing distances that are appropriate for each of them. Um, and they, they have the opportunity to see each other's point of view. Um, the person in the gallery could stand really close to the painting and could catalog position and the color of every one of the dots of paint and could describe the painting to you in that way. But that wouldn't be the most useful way of understanding what she was seeing. And likewise, the spider, if he wanted to, he could spend his entire lifetime walking around this painting, gathering information on all of the different lots of paint. And, um, and eventually, uh, if he had the brain power, he would be able to work out what the painting was of. Again, it wouldn't be the most useful description for him. He just needs to know, you know, he started building a web on the green blob over there, or he spotted a fly on the yellow blob over there. This is not a talk about art. This is a talk about physics. Um, so how does this apply to physics? Well, the exact same idea is true of physical systems. Um, if you're looking at, say, a block of ice, it's going to look very different depending on how closely you're looking at it. So if you're looking at it on a sort of human scale, say you're an ice sculptor who wants to make this nice ice sculpture, um, what you need to know about it is that it's a cold, transparent, uniform block of material. And you probably need to know how hard it is and at what point it will start melting and things about the sort of bulk of the material like that. If you start to zoom in really, really, really far, it no longer looks like a uniform block of material. It now looks like you start to see the crystal structure. And if you zoom in even further, you start to see that the crystal itself is made up of individual atoms. So depending on the sort of length scale at which you're sort of looking at this thing, it's going to need a very different description. And once you really want to look at something on very, very short distances, we're going to have to start to worry about how to look at it. Um, and on the on very, very small distances, you have to start to worry about the wavelength of the light that you're looking at it with. Because if you're trying to look at a tiny detail with wavelengths that are longer than the size of the detail you're trying to look at, it's not going to work. You're not going to be able to pick up that level of detail. And this is exactly the same idea as Sura when he was making his painting. He wasn't able to draw any details that were smaller than the size of the lots of paint that he was using. Same idea here. And light has this uh, particular property that if you increase the energy, decrease the wavelength. If you want a shorter wavelength, you're going to have to have more energetic light. And this is why um, if you want to study crystals or molecules, you can't generally use visible light because the wavelength is too long, but you can use X-rays uh, because X-rays are far more energetic than visible light. They have a shorter wavelength. The wavelength can then be of the same size as the atomic spacing. Um, and so, for example, this is an X-ray image of a DNA molecule. Um, and by looking at that molecule with X-rays, um, scientists were able to determine that it has this double helix structure. So again, higher energy, you're going to allow yourself to see smaller details. But light is not the only way that you have of looking at something. Um, one of the major achievements of early 20th century physics was the understanding of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics showed us many weird and unintuitive things about the world. 
And one of them is that uh, waves and particles are not as different as they would first appear. They actually share many of the same properties. This is called pa wave-particle duality. This means that particles have wavelengths too. So you can use beams of particles exactly as you would beams of light to observe something. And again, we have this same relation between energy uh, and wavelength. So if you want to see smaller distances, you need more energy. Um, and this, this idea allows you to make microscopes using charged particles instead of using light. Um, and and uh, the advantage of using charged particles instead of light is it's very easy to increase the energy of charged particles and therefore get down to smaller details. Um, you, you just have to have a voltage and the, um, the charged particles go across the voltage and they, they gain a lot of energy that way. This is the idea of an electron microscope which allows you to see very small things. So for example, this is a electron microscope image of some pollen grains, very detailed and all seen with um, particles rather than waves. Um, and again, yeah, higher energy, smaller details. So we can extend this idea. And if we want to get to the smallest possible distances, and we want to start to examine what's going on at these tiny, tiny distances, we're going to need even higher energy. And to get higher energy, you need to accelerate um, your, your beams to like across huge distances. And this is why small things need big experiments. So this is a sort of the schematic bird's eye view of our most powerful particle experiment, um, which is the Large Hadron Collider outside of Geneva in Switzerland. And here, um, in the same way that an electron microscope um, uh, accelerates the electrons to see small details, here, instead of electrons, we're using the other charged particle that you find in an atom, which is a proton. Other than that, it's the exact same idea. And the protons get accelerated first around this small ring, and then around this big ring until they're extremely energetic and eventually they're collided into each other at various points along the ring. Um, and for this reason, because we have this much energy and it's the most energetic, um, and again, you know, higher energy means you're probing smaller distances. This is why the Large Hadron Collider can be thought of as the world's most powerful microscope. In fact, the energy of the collisions is a billion times the energy of the electron beam in an electron microscope. Really getting down to very, very, very small distance. Um, and you'll have noticed that, you know, describing it as a microscope is a bit strange because if, if you're thinking about a microscope, you're normally thinking about like you're looking at a particular object and you're focusing on a particular object. Whereas here I've said that we're just smashing protons into each other. Um, so what are we actually looking at? Um, well, uh, due to Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared, you can actually create matter. You can create mass out of energy. This is energy here. This is mass. This is the speed of light squared. So the stuff that we're looking at is actually created for us out of the energy of the collisions. We don't need to be focusing on anything in particular. We, we are creating smallest stuff that we're wanting to look at. And around these uh, collision points, uh, we have big detectors, which essentially just take photos of what is coming out of these collisions uh, so that we can see what's going on there. So uh, because of this relation, um, this Einstein's relation between energy and mass, as well as higher energy allowing, it, allowing us to probe smaller distances, Higher energy also allows us to generate larger mass. And so for particle physicists, because of these relations, all of these quantities are essentially the same thing to us. Um, the energy, the smaller distances, and the masses. We measure them all on the same scale, in the same units. Now we'll be using this kind of multi-purpose energy, inverse distance, mass scale in the rest of the talk. Okay, so I've spent a while explaining how we look at the smallest distances. 
what what do we see there? What is the state of the art for particle physics and for understanding the smallest constituents of the universe? Well, um, once you look at the smallest distance scales, um, you find that the proton inside the atom is not a fundamental particle in its own right, but it's made up of smaller things, made up of things called quarks. And um, in particular, within the proton and also within the neutron, there are two types of quarks, one called up and one called down, and they have opposite uh, sign charges. Um, but the other particle that's in an atom, the electron, as far as we know, that one is a fundamental particle. Um, and those aren't the only subatomic particles that we know about. There are sort of copies of all of these. So the up has uh, two siblings, the charm and the top, which are almost the same thing as the up, but they just have heavier masses. Um, likewise, the down and down has the strange and the bottom. And the electron also has two copies, the muon and the tau, which are just heavier versions of the electron. And that's almost it for the matter particles. There are just three more, which are very, very light, electrically neutral things called neutrinos, which are very, very hard to, hard to detect. Um, but they, they're around. And finally, we also have some other particles, which are called bosons, which essentially transmit forces. And this collection of particles makes up what's known as the standard model. Um, which isn't a very inspiring name, but it's, you know, it's, it's really, you know, the, the, the smallest distances we can probe, everything in the world, everything that we see around us seems to be made up of just these handful of particles. And the standard model isn't just, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a list of particles. It's a full theory, you know, it's most naturally written in kind of mathematical language. language. And it explains how these things interact and how they behave and how they're able to create everything we see around us. Um, and the standard model is both quite uh, an old and quite a young theory in that the um, theory itself was completed in the 1970s. But at that point, we had only discovered some of these particles. Um, so what was amazing was that just this, you know, this sort of math predicts new particles um, that should be discovered if the theory was true, and they were discovered. They, the, the, the maths became real. And, um, and so here I've just highlighted some of the um, most recent particles to be discovered. Um, and this is why this is why I say I say it's quite young because some of them are dis were discovered very recently. Um, so, the top quark, which is the heaviest quark, was discovered in 1995 at the Tevatron experiment um, at Fermi Lab in Chicago. And the reason why this was the last to be discovered is precisely because it's the heaviest quark. And you know, as I said, if you want to reach higher masses, you you need to go to higher energies. And it was only in 1995 when we had a glider that was energetic enough to produce this heavy quark. Um, then five years later, the tau neutrino was discovered. Now the neutrinos are very light. So the problem with discovering this one wasn't that you know it was heavy and we needed to reach the energies. It's just that it's very, very difficult to detect it. It's electrically neutral, doesn't really do very much. Um, so, so that was why it took a while to discover that one. And finally, um, very recently, just a decade ago, the Higgs boson was discovered at the LHC. And again, the Higgs is heavy, so we needed energies that we, that, that we didn't have until the LHC before we could discover the Higgs. So the Higgs was the last piece of the puzzle, the last um, article that was predicted by the standard model um, and it was an amazing sort of confirmation of this theory that was written down in the 70s. And this works extremely well to explain a lot of things. It agrees with like all the experimental measurements and it's really, you know, it's really working extremely well. So what next? Um, 
we come to the end of particle physicists out of the out of a job um if it works so well um well not quite because although it has these incredible successes the Xander model also has some very spectacular failures um and one of the most spectacular is that if we look out into the universe we look at galaxies we look you know at the structure of the universe and the evolution of the universe on a large scale there's a lot of stuff missing um so a lot of the gravity that we can see holding things together cannot be explained by by the matter that we can see so you should be able to see matter because it glows um at least all of the matter in the standard model all the atoms and things um but there's some stuff there which we can't see. And if we look at galaxies uh, and we look at how the stars are going around, they're going around very, very fast. And, and it doesn't make sense with the amount of mass that we can actually see because it should just be flying apart. It, you know, we can't see enough stuff to hold it together by gravity. So there must be some other kind of mass there, some other kind of matter which doesn't behave like any of the particles of the standard model, but it still does look and behave, according to all of the um, observations, it still does look and behave pretty particle-like. So it seems to be something that's missing from our theory. Um, so that's a major one. <laughs> um, another thing is um, the neutrinos. So um, if you watch a neutrino going about its day, it turns out that it will change from one kind of neutrino into another, and then into the third, and then back again. Remember that there were three different kinds of neutrinos in the standard model. And the standard model would say, if you look at you know the predictions of the standard model, it would say a neutrino should stay as it is. Um, but they don't, and we don't know why. And uh, that's something that needs some, some explanation beyond the standard model. And finally, this one's a bit kind of woolly and aesthetic, but you know, this theory, it has a lot of numbers that you have to put in by hand. And once you've sort of put them in by hand and you've got the right number, then everything works. But it's not clear where they come from. It would be nice to have a deeper explanation of why these numbers appear in our theory. Okay, so how can the standard model be so successful such a failure at the same time um well you know this, this is kind of this is kind of what happens to most theories actually um so all theories have some you know some places where they work really really well and some places where they completely fail um so for example newtonian gravity newton's theory of gravity works very well to explain how gravity is working in this room even works very well to explain how gravity is working within the solar system. But once you start looking out into space and you start to see things like black holes and light bending around very massive objects, then Newton's theory can't explain that. You need a new theory of gravity, uh, the one that Einstein came up with, general relativity. And likewise, if you, if you want to play a game of pool, um, and you want to understand how the balls are going to move around, you can do that perfectly using just good old classical mechanics, hundreds of years old, um, and it's going to work very well. As soon as you want to understand the hydrogen atom, you're going to completely fail with classical mechanics, and you need another of the early 20th century's great achievements, quantum mechanics. So likewise, you know, it could be that we're, we're just, we've, we've discovered, we're sort of starting to map out where the standard model works well and where we need something else, something new to come in and fix these problems. Um, so how can we go about finding something beyond the standard model? Um, well, in the last uh, you know few decades, um, every time we've gone to higher energy, we've discovered a new particle. Um, so this is a plot. There's lots of uh, acronyms here which don't matter at all. All it's showing is that you know the last few decades, uh, 
on this axis. And then the lines um, and the points show um, the energies of different experiments over time. So you can see that you know, the energy of these particle physics experiments is going up. And we have discoveries at every point. We have the discovery of the W and Z bosons, which are some of the force carriers of the standard model. Um, then we discovered the top quark, and we discovered the Higgs boson. So maybe now that we've completed the standard model, if we continue to go to higher energies, we will start to discover new particles, which could come along with this new theory that could help, you know, could help solve some of these problems. So, you know, that's the hope. If we just keep the faith and keep going to higher energies, maybe it will all become clear. Um, and in fact, in the short term, the hope is that um, we might already be reaching those energies. So this is, um, this is my promised, you know, multi-purpose scale, which is measuring larger energy, larger mass, and shorter distance as you go up. And here we are at the highest energies we've ever reached at the LHC. And we know that to some extent, the standard model is working extremely well at the LHC. I mean, after all, the LHC discovered the Higgs boson. You know, it, it had this huge, incredible confirmation of the standard model with the discovery of the Higgs boson. But if we're really hopeful, we might hope that, the, that we are reaching this sort of crossover point where some new theory is coming in and where we might start to make some new discoveries that are beyond the standard model already with the collisions that we have at the LHC. But we don't really know what we're looking for. We're kind of, um, you know, we expect something to come in, but we don't know exactly what it is or where it should take over from the standard model. So we could well be in this, in this uh, position where we, we are, the standard model is still working very well. It's still raining at LHC collision energies. And, you know, this new theory, this these new particles that we're kind of expecting to come in are out of our reach, at least with our current experiment. So, you know, what to do in the meantime before maybe we can build a new, a new experiment. Um, well, here I want to... Um, give you a little analogy. Um, this is a uh, murmuration of starlings. And I know it's a murmuration of starlings because that's what I typed into Google Images to get this picture. <laughs> but imagine that you were looking at this thing and you had no idea what it was. You can see that it's made up of like smaller parts, but you can't see at this distance, you can't see whether they're birds, whether they're insects, whether they're some kind of strange weather phenomenon and you can't get any closer and you don't have any more powerful binoculars this is all you can see so what can you do to work out you know, what's going on what this thing is made up of um, well, one thing you can do is you can stand and stare and watch them for a while and in this way you you see how this sort of cloud moves maybe that gives you some clues and you know maybe you can hope that even though they're all mostly staying in a bunch, maybe one of these things will come a bit closer to you and you can start to pick out some more features and work out what it is. But another thing that you can do <laughs> is you can stand where you are and you can look around you for indirect evidence as to what these things are. And in this case, the indirect evidence would be that your car is covered in bird droppings. And this will only give you some information you won't be able to tell, you know, how big the birds are and how, you know, and what species they are, but at least you know they're birds. So that's a good start. And um, at the risk of making my job sound less than glamorous, I'm going to explain to you over the next few slides what these bird droppings are in the world of particle physics and how we're looking for them. Um, but to do that, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. I'm going to... Um, I'll tell you a story from the history of particle physics. So at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a great amount of interest in this new phenomenon of radioactivity. It was discovered that um, some atoms were radioactive and would change from one element to another. 
um, by emitting some kind of radiation. And in particular, some uh, radioactive nuclei, oh, sorry. Ah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, some radioactive nuclei um, undergo beta decay, which means that they um, emit a electron. Uh, and what's actually happening is a neutron changing into a proton and emitting an electron and a neutrino which escape from the nucleus. Um, and in this way, a neutron in the nucleus changes into a proton and uh, the nucleus changes from one element to another. So for example, um, this can happen to change uh, carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. And this is how carbon dating is done uh, by observing this process. So physicists at the beginning of the 20th century were looking at this process and trying to understand what was going on um, and how this was happening. And in 1933, Enrico Fermi um, made a suggestion for how this was happening, uh, which was that there is this, this new um, weak interaction between these four particles, between the neutron, the proton, the electron, and the neutrino. And the way that this you know, makes the process happen is you can imagine this neutron coming in to this interaction, which, which I've drawn with a star, um, disappearing. And what comes out is the proton, the electron, and the neutrino. Um, and in this way, the, the neutron is changing into these three particles. And, um, and at this level, it just looks like a picture that I've drawn on the slide. Of course, this came backed up with, you know, a whole theory, um, a load of maths that you could use to then, you know, do calculations and make predictions about the various properties of this process. You could then compare with experiment, and it seemed to work very well. Um, and because so physicists interaction is kind of synonymous with force, so this became known as the weak nuclear force because it's an interaction that happens very weakly inside nuclei. And what this weak means in practical terms is just that these decays don't happen very often. They happen sort of sporadically. Okay, so um, if you ask um, Enrico Fermi uh, in 1933 what was going on here, he would say it's a new interaction between these particles that we already know about, the neutron, the proton, the electron, the neutrino. But in the decades that followed, um, physicists continued to think about this. And in the 1960s, um, these people came up with a new idea for what was going on. They said, um, actually, what's happening is there's a new particle involved, which is making this process happen. Um, and they called this particle the W, which stood for weak. And, um, and according to them, what was going on was that a neut neutron was coming in was changing into this new W particle and a proton. And then immediately the W particle was disintegrating into an electron and a neutrino. And so they predicted the existence of this new particle, this previously undiscovered particle. And um, at CERN, they built a new collider and they discovered this particle in the 1970s. So this was a, uh, you know, this was a ringing endorsement of this idea predicted a particle, it was found, clearly they were right. Um, and, you know, Fermi must have been wrong. Um, but you'll notice that the way I've set up the slide is supposed to remind you of the person and the uh, spider in the art gallery. And in that case, they were both right. They were both correctly describing what they were seeing. They were just describing it from different length scales. And exactly the same thing turns out to be true here. Um, Fermi's picture works very, very well on long length scales or equivalently low energies. Um, whereas at higher energies, this theory takes over and, become, and becomes the sort of appropriate picture to use. Um, and so if, if I draw this on, on our multipurpose um, energy scale, um, it turns out that Fermi's theory um, has, you know, has has the right picture um, at energies which are too small to be able to directly create 
mass of the W boson from E equals mc squared. Um, but as soon as you go higher than this energy, you need to start using the electroweak theory. Things start looking a lot more like this. And um, another interesting thing is, you know, this whole theory, both, both theories, were, were called weak. But actually, once you start to understand this picture, you realize that it's only weak at low energies. It's weak at the energies when, you know, where the nuclei are disintegrating, where this beta decay is happening. Um, but within Fermi's theory, um, the strength of this interaction is actually proportional um, to the square of the energy divided by this, this mass of the W boson. As you go up in energy, um, it gets stronger and stronger. And by the time you sort of start to see things in terms of this uh, new particle, it's actually not, not weak at all. So this sort of this story is part of a, a sort of more general picture that happens again and again in particle physics, which is that if you have some new particle, which is heavy and therefore you know you it only sort of starts to make itself known at high energies. Then if you're looking at its effects at lower energies, it looks like a new interaction between particles. Um, and this this sort of new interaction picture is known as an effective field theory uh, to particle physicists. It's just jargon, but that's that's, that's the jargon for this. Um, Right. So what does this mean for how we look for a new particle at the LHC? Um, well, if, uh, you know, if we are at this energy um, above the mass of the new particle, so, you know, our collisions are energetic enough to directly create this new particle out of the collisions, then it's straightforward. We, we, we just sort of keep a close eye on our detectors and we start to see, you know, we 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 will eventually see this particle being produced. We'll see a sure sign of it. This is how you know, the Higgs boson was discovered. This is how every particle most particles have been discovered. Um, but we now have another string to our bow, because if you know if our collision energy is actually below the mass of this new particle, we can just look for these new interactions between known particles, um, in this case, between the particles of the standard model, um, which could give us clues that there is a new particle at a higher scale out of our region. And we're kind of working in the dark here. We, you know, we, we finished the standard model. We're looking for something beyond it, but we don't actually know for sure what that thing should be. And in particular, we don't know what the mass of any new particles that we're looking for should be. So while we're working in the dark, we have to do both of these things, make sure that we're covering both options. Um, and if we're looking for these new interactions between standard model particles that could be you know, the clues, sort of these are the, the bird droppings that we're looking for, um, then you know, we have a bit of a problem, which is that the standard model itself um, predicts a lot of interactions between the standard model particles. You know, this is how atoms are held together. This is how you know, stars shine. This is how everything that we see works is because there are these interactions between the standard model particles. Um, so how can we disentangle these new interactions that would be very exciting and something beyond the standard model from the interactions that we already expect from the standard model itself. Um, well, a good place to look is by focusing in on pro processes that the standard model claims should be impossible or very, very rare. Um, and then if we start to see something going on in those processes, then that could be a sure sign that these new interactions are going on and causing these processes to happen. And at the LHC, um, there are four different collision points. Um, and at each of these collision points, there's an experiment. And each of these experiments is specialized to do a particular thing. 
And one of them called LHCB is particularly specialized to look for these rare or possible processes in order to, yeah, in order to find new interaction. And one such process that LHCB is particularly looking for uh, is, 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 a, is a process where a quark changes into another quark of the same charge. Um, so you remember that there were these sort of three families of each type of quark. Um, and for example, um, it's very rare in the standard model for a bottom quark to change into a strange quark. And if you're thinking of some new interaction that can cause this to happen, um, it's one such interaction is shown here with this uh, star again. So here you can think of a bottom quark coming into the interaction, disappearing, and what comes out is a strange quark and a pair of oppositely charged muons. Uh, muons um, are the heavier version of the electron. So, um, this is great. We can look for this. Um, the trouble is that in the real world, things are not quite so simple because um, quarks, you know, they don't like to be alone. They interact with each other so strongly that you never see a quark on its own. They're always buddied up into either threes, as they are in the proton and the neutron, or into twos. And if a bottom quark is um, created out of the energy of the collisions with the LHC, then one of the main ways that it likes to buddy up is with an anti-up quark. Instead of seeing, instead of looking out for a bottom quark, you have to look out for one of these, uh, one of these sort of pairs that are bound together. And other than that, everything goes goes on the same way. Um, this bottom quark goes into the interaction, changes into a strange quark, and the strange quark um, then automatically has a buddy to go with, which is this anti-up quark. And this anti-up quark does nothing in the interaction. It's, it's just along for the ride. And for this reason, we call it spectator quark. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, you know, there's a lot of particles here. You really don't need to uh, remember exactly what's going on. But the point is that this gives, this gives us something for the experiment to, to look for. It looks for these B mesons, it looks for when they change into a kaon, a muon, and, an, and another muon. Um, and, uh, and literally, you know, counts how many times it happens. And if it happens more or less often than the standard model would predict, then that's, that's interesting. And that could be the first sign of a new interaction. Um, and you'll notice that this is, you know, this is quite analogous to beta decays. They're a neutron was changing into a proton and an electron and then an, a neutrino. Here, we've just got a B meson changing into a pion and two muons. It's the same kind of idea. And um, very excitingly, um, the LHCB experiment last year, it released the results of, you know, of it looking for these, um, these B meson decays. And um, they do seem to be disagreeing with what the standard model would say. Um, and this got a lot of people very excited and it hit the news. Um, us particle physicists are a cautious bunch and this is not yet at the level where we would claim a discovery. Um, so, you know, in order to be sure of what's going on, we need to collect more data to make sure that there isn't something weirdly statistical going on. We also need to, double and triple check that we understand the theory and that we understand every aspect of the experiment. Um, so this is definitely an ongoing um, project, but it's certainly interesting that um, we're starting to see something in exactly these kinds of places where you where you would expect to start to see the, the effects of these new interactions. And if, if it is confirmed to be a new interaction, it has to be due to a new particle. Um, and this, so you remember that uh, with beta decay, we had this new interaction, which at higher energies became clear that it was it was a sign of a new part of the W boson. And in exactly the same way, if this is a new interaction beyond the standard model, at higher energies, it will, it has to um, be 
first sign of a new of a new particle, which is sort of mediating um, mediating this effect between the part of, between the standard model particles in the same way as the W boson. Now, because we're not completely sure what we're looking at yet, don't know what this particle would be, or even how it will connect um, these particles together. So it could be something like this. It could be something like this. Or it could be something more complicated than either of those things. And we will have to uh, wait and see. But, uh, you know, we don't have to. Meantime, there are things we can do. We, we're not just sitting around and waiting um, for new data from the LHCB experiment. Uh, because if there is a new particle and we're seeing its low energy you know, clues in, in these new interactions, and we'd expect to see it in more than one place. And um, this, this actually um, this was something that happened with, with Fermi's theory of beta decay as well, because so he came up with this idea of how beta decay was happening in uh, 1933. And after that, um, the muon was discovered and um, and it was observed to decay, the muon was observed to decay into an electron and two neutrinos. And it was realized that actually muon decay could be understood in a very similar way uh, by a muon coming into uh, some interaction. Oh. What comes out is the electron and the two neutrinos. And it was also realized that these two interactions, the one that um, could produce muon decay and the one that could produce beta decay had the exact same strength. So that was really sort of intriguing. That was a definite clue. That maybe these things had a common origin. And sure enough, uh, once the W boson was discovered, it was understood that both of these things are, are at high energies due to the W boson. Um, and so sure enough, it looked similar. And they were similar. They 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 pointed to the same underlying high energy description. And so likewise, we can sort of scour all of the data we have for other signs of new interactions that could be, you know, pointing towards the same new particle or the same theory of several particles, maybe. Um, and there's the, the, this experiment at Fermilab uh, in Chicago. And its purpose is to measure how the muon interacts with the photon. Um, so the muon interacts with the photon within the standard model. That's something that happens. Um, but we've been measuring it very, very, very precisely. And it seems like what they are seeing does not quite agree with the standard model. And so possibly, what that is pointing to is some new contribution from a new interaction coming in uh, to influence how, how the muon and the photon are talking to each other. And uh, it was a big year last year because uh, these guys also released um, their data. And they also you know, had this statement that maybe it was uh, a bit different from the standard model. Um, and again, to be cautious about these things there, you know, we need to wait um, for confirmation of this and we need to be triple, triple sure um, that we that we understand in particular the, the standard model prediction for this, which is not easy. Um, but it's very interesting. And one thing that's very interesting about it is that this is a is, you know, if it's real, it's a new interaction involving muons and the interaction that LHCB was looking at was also involving muons. It was involving bottom quark, strange quark, and two muons. And so this could be hinting to a common origin if, if both of them were confirmed, and then that would give us a lot of clues for how, what you know, we were seeing. And uh, it's going to be an exciting few years because um, after a two year break for upgrades, the LHCB has just restarted for its third run. And um, in this third run, we're going to have even more collisions per second uh, than previously. And they're at a slightly higher energy. 
Um, so one of the main goals for this new um, third run is to really you know, gather more data on B mesons and really pin down whether they're whether they're behaving themselves or whether there's you know some new interaction going on, which is very exciting. Um, another thing that the LHC can do, which no previous accelerator was able to do, is to really study the top quark and the Higgs boson. So I told you that these are some of the youngest um, particles of the standard model. They were only discovered relatively recently, and they really haven't been scrutinized as much as the other particles of the standard model. Um, and so if, you know, if there's any place where there's, there's a real potential for these new interactions to sort of go up, it could be there. You know, we, we really haven't um, uh, looked too deeply at that yet. And, and it will be really interesting to, um, to see what's going on there. So um, we are all watching this space. Very excitedly. Um, I'm going to leave you uh, with this picture I took of um, of uh, a sort of signpost in someone's garden just just around the corner from the uh, physics center. And it's got a uh, quote from um, the artist Robert Smithson: "Size determines an object, but skill determines art." We've established that this is not a talk about art, but Apologies to Robert Smithson. I can easily fix this to be a summary of my talk. Size determines an object, but scale determines physics. And I've told you that you know at different length scales, you see different layers of physics emerge. And maybe over the next few years, uh, we will start to uncover a new layer. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any any questions. Yeah. Here is a, as a theoretical concept, if you could accelerate this particle in a Hadron super collider to the speed of light, would you then reach the absolute absence of heavy particle discovery? Would that be it? Could there be any other heavy particles that wouldn't be discovered that way? Um I guess my answer would be yes, that would be infinite energy. <laughs> but the trouble is that because you need infinite energy to accelerate any, you know, the proton has mass. You know, it's 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 not particularly heavy compared to some of the particles I've been talking about, but it has mass. And you in order to accelerate it to exactly the speed of light, you would need infinite energy, which is obviously not, not possible. I mean in, in the LHC, they are going at something like 99.999, I don't know how many nines percent of the speed of light. But, you know, getting from there to one to 100% is, is impossible, <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, yep. Well, it's uh, six nines. Six okay. Thank you. After the decimal point. So, so dark matter makes up a fairly large percentage of the mass of the scene. Yeah. In general, from what I've read, the more mass of the particle, the less time it lasts, usually. They're not around very long. So how is it finding a very evanescent heavy particle is going to account for a large mass, which is clearly there? If it's only there for 10 to the 12th seconds. Yeah. It hardly ever appears. So dark matter. Um, we know that it it has to be stable. So there are only a few particles we know of that are stable. One is the electron, um, another is the proton. But dark matter, you know, it, it, it has to it has to stay in its form uh, one way or another. It has to also be a stable particle. Um, and there are various different ways to achieve that theoretically. Um, one way is you know, to, to sort of make an analogy with the proton and the same thing that makes the proton stable makes dark matter stable. But what it means for looking for dark matter in at the LHC is that it will be created, it wouldn't decay into anything else. It would just leave the detector. 
we would just see something that that had just taken some energy away. Um, so yeah, in general, the heavier the particle, the shorter lived it is, as long as it can decay. And the general assumption is that dark matter either can't decay or decays on such so slowly that it would still be there in the sky. Um, yeah. So follow on question. Um, suppose if, if, if whatever this matter is doesn't interact with strong electroweak, electromagnetic, would any of these experiments detect it in any way? Yeah, so um, hope is that it interacts in some way with with our world because you know, if it doesn't interact with any of the standard model particles in any way other than gravity, we know it interacts by gravity. But gravity is so weak that yeah, if there is no other interaction, then we have almost no chance of of working out what it is. But uh, the hope is that it has it does have some kind of interaction the standard model which will allow us to see it um or or to create it at, at the lhc um yeah but it you know at the moment it's much of it is old. yeah i mean yeah. i don't know any other way forward but it seems not my tell at this point so, just a very quick comment on that i mean there is if there was no interactions it would be very hard to understand why it's so prevalent in the universe so that's not a really direct thing right we do expect it to have other interactions besides gravity. Yeah, and there's also the fact that you know this is not the only way that the standard model fails. So if something is something else has to come in to sort of fix the other problems of the standard model, maybe that has something to do with dark matter, just by kind of Tim's razor um, type idea. But but yeah, it's the. Any other ways to detect dark matter? Other than just smashing them into each other. Um, well, in the case of dark matter, there are the, are other ways of looking for it because you know we know that it's all around us, um, and so there are big dark matter detection experiments. Which so far, haven't seen anything, but they are getting more and more powerful. Um, to hope that you know this kind of sort of wind of dark matter that's passing through the earth will sort of bounce off an atom in some way we start to see it um so for dark matter there's you know the, there's things like that in in terms of directly you know creating a new particle gliders are kind of the only way because they're the only way we can create that amount of energy in a controlled way um, i mean historically uh, you know another sort of nature's sort of version of um, a particle accelerator is uh, cosmic rays, just very um, energetic uh, particles raining down on us from space. Um, and this was how the muon was discovered, actually, um, in sort of, I think, the 30s, um, by watching what was coming out of cosmic rays and seeing that there was this new particle, which looked like an electron, but not, was being produced Again, it's kind of the same. It's the same idea. It's just natural, <laughs> but it's therefore also a lot, a lot harder to control. Um, and the only reason that the muon was able to be discovered was because it sort of, it, it's long lived and it lasted long enough to reach us down at the Earth. Um, so, yeah, I think accelerators are better. Yeah. Is is the current thinking that at the moment of the Big Bang, these elementary particles were what existed at that time? Is that the assumption? Of the yeah, basically, because, you know, um, yeah, as you go, you know, as you go up in energy, um, you go from a situation where, you know, at, we're at quite, you know, low energies now compared to the Big Bang. Everything is solid or liquid or gas, and there's atoms and stuff. But as you increase the energy, then the atoms break apart, and then eventually the protons and neutrons break apart into quarks. Um, and so, you know, at the Big Bang, in the first sort of fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, it was so hot that that was what existed. But it quite quickly, you know, sort of condensed into nuclei and things like this. 
was the was the reduction in energy allowing the gravitational forces or the weak forces or these forces between these elementary particles to form atoms? Is that the assumption of how that atoms happen? They kept it? Yeah, basically it's like um yeah, it's like so it's the same thing as if you heat up um a saucepan of water and it turns into gas, um, but then it cools down and condenses. It's the same idea. You know, it was so hot that it was just quarks and you know, uh, like fundamental particles or what we understand to be fundamental. But then as it cooled down, these things condensed into the atoms that we know. And eventually, you know, eventually into galaxies and stars and All right, well, there are no comments, but thank you. Uh, okay, yeah.